But for a lot of transport, it's actually the exact opposite. You don't want it to be spontaneous. You don't want it to all of a sudden be in another part of the country than it's expected to be. They need predictability and they need to make sure that it actually arrives on time. Just this fall, we were actually the first to get a uh, permit to drive on public road in the U.S. Uh, without the safety driver in, in the vehicle. And so, of course, that was a huge milestone for, for us, but I think also for the industry to say that this is uh, considered to be safe enough to go on public roads. What we believe is when you start to... Um, introduce autonomous is that you will still want to have a human in the loop. So we will still have remote operators or op um, remote monitors, even though you, you know, you're not directly driving the vehicle, but just to make sure that everything is, is happening as it should be. And what this gives an opportunity for is for drivers to work in, a, in another type of setup. So it, it could be closer to home, it could be like more like normal office hours, and it's, it just becomes a completely new type of work. And there's so many benefits to this new type of position. And that's also what we've been seeing when we've been doing surveys that a lot of more people find this job more attractive. So we're very excited about that and starting to roll out that in, in a bigger scale as well. of the future is going to be a place that could be anywhere. It's going to be a place that you do not go to all the time. We need to be fully flexible in our outlook about how offices are used and where we work. But at the core of this debate about workers is that everybody wants to understand why they're being asked to do the work and to do the work fairly in a way that meets the era we're in. And that era I call the nowhere office because we need to embrace the fact that we are nowhere where we were and we are going to the next phase of work. It's a very important and exciting moment. It's actually 
not the workers that need to change, it's the leaders. They need to learn to listen. And there's quite a lot of evidence that you have a few dinosaurs, you have a few you have a few corporate leaders who still want to flex shame their workers, for instance. But that's not the majority. I think the majority understand that the change is here and it's about using that opportunity to increase productivity, to increase engagement, to increase true well-being, which is when you're heard and you're listened to and when you're well managed and when you're remunerated fairly, you're going to do better work and you're going to be feeling better as you do that work. Of course, there is great inequality in the workforces and there are what I call hybrid haves and hybrid have-nots. There are often people working in the same workforce who are unable to work flexibly, which causes resentments and difficulties. One is to be social and to gather by the water cooler. The second is to learn and to learn intergenerationally. And the third is actually to disagree to argue, to work out tough stuff. And you may find that the demographic I call the learners, the early stage entrance to the job market, might need more immersive periods in the office than the elder generation I call the leavers. Si tiene fiebre, si tiene una rodilla rota y por eso no puede ir al trabajo, tendrá la baja. Pues si una persona que es mujer tiene una menstruación que le impide, impide trabajar o estar mmm, decentemente en un puesto de trabajo, ya que una menstruación fuerte pues puede ser algo muy jodido, si puedo decir eso, pues me parece perfectamente como cualquier persona que tiene un problema de salud y se pide unos días de trabajo.